Oh man, this was an exciting week in space and we've got a lot to cover. We have a spacewalk that was the first of its kind. We've got new suits from NASA that can do moonwalks and a whole new booster being tested. I've somehow got to squeeze all of this into a very short amount of time. That way Jamie doesn't get mad at me again. So I'm Jared and this is your Space News for October 24th, 2019. And we're gonna get started by heading on over to China for this week's only launch. Departing on October 17th at 1521 Universal Time, a Long March 3B rocket left the Xishang Space Center in southwestern China. The payload, a spacecraft called TJS-4, was placed into an elliptical transfer orbit like most satellites headed to geostationary orbit. But this one was different. The China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology announced that the mission was successful, and that was it. Chinese state media said that the TJS-4 satellite will test communications technologies, and the three previous TJS satellites launched in 2015, 2017, and 2018 were also described as such, but analysts and amateur satellite trackers indicate they are more likely for military use. We've got no upcoming departures this week. I'm supremely disappointed in the Earth. I mean, I guess I could go out and buy my own launch if I wanted to very, very quickly. Not sure who to buy it from, but yeah, nothing is on the docket. But there is something very, very big that happened in spaceflight in the past week, a first of its kind spacewalk. And to tell us a little bit more about it, here's Jade Kim. NASA astronauts recently completed a spacewalk and, uh, oh hey, it just so happened to be all women, a historic first in NASA's 60 years of existence. On October 18, 2019, Christina Koch and Jessica Meir embarked on a seven-hour long spacewalk outside the International Space Station, a first for Meir and the fourth for Koch. After training for over six years in the first class of astronauts to be equal parts men and women, Koch and Mir successfully executed a rather uneventful, in a good way, spacewalk replacing a faulty battery charge discharge unit that failed to activate after a previous spacewalk on October 11th. The first all-woman spacewalk had been previously scheduled for March with Koch and astronaut Anne McLean, but was delayed due to the lack of proper fitting spacesuits. Koch is also on track to set a record for the longest single spaceflight by a woman, with an expected 328 days aboard the ISS. Although to them it was essentially just another day on the ISS, aka, hey, I'm just doing my job, the historical and cultural significance did not go unnoticed. Considering it wasn't too long ago that women were systemically excluded from spaceflight for reasons since proven unfounded, the fact that two women were now working side by side outside the ISS signifies a greater trend within NASA overall. A broader call for diversity in the name of societal advancement. And it's not just diversity for diversity's sake. Bringing an array of perspectives to the table ensures we have the best chances at solving complex problems, making sure we stay innovative and competitive in the global field, and continuing to build a STEM workforce that more accurately mirrors the makeup of society that will sustain us for generations to come. Furthermore, Koch and Mir are also two of the 12 women being considered to step foot on the moon in 2024 under NASA's Artemis mission. And all of this echoes a very important sentiment integral to tomorrow's DNA that space is a place for everyone. Now, I already know someone is typing out some sort of nasty comment below, something that's well outside of the usual politeness the community of tomorrow exudes. And I wanted to include this story because it represents a great moment for humanity. This is something that we had not been able to accomplish yet. Seeing folks legitimately excited over the spacewalk, an excitement that just doesn't happen anymore, that in and of itself goes to show just how big of a deal this was. I mean, I was deeply disappointed when the original attempt earlier this year fell apart. Safety is safety, though. The right call is the right call. But 54 years after the first spacewalk, here we finally are, two women on the same playing field as everyone before them. As Jade mentioned, here at Tomorrow, one of our core principles is that we believe spaceflight is for everyone. We've got a long way to go, but working towards that future, we're not just looking at making the world an equal place, but equitably uplifting everyone. So it's not one over the other. What I'm saying is that space, 
space is for everyone. And this was a step in that direction. Right beneath your feet, so don't move down. Copy. I don't know anyone who doesn't like looking good. And I know if you go to a science conference, all the scientists there, it's going to be a mishmash of fashion faux pas. And I know that you're not supposed to be wearing white after Labor Day, apparently, but NASA knows that in space and on the moon, well, you can wear white anytime because it never goes out of style. Meet the Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit. You've probably noticed Extravehicular Mobility Unit is included in its name, like the present spacesuits that are on the International Space Station. But those up there right now are designed for a microgravity environment, so the Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit may share quite a lot of technology with its station-bound counterpart, but it's designed for walking around on the surface of the moon. And don't worry about that garish color scheme. The red will likely stay, but it's small stripes on only one suit to help tell who's who during lunar EVAs. But that blue, gone. Get that out of here. With white, that's probably going to make up most of the suit's exterior material to help with thermal loads. But after a few steps in the lunar regolith, it's going to get gray really fast. And speaking of, that regolith on the moon is pretty darn nasty. It's like little microscopic shards of glass. And that's not the only problem you have to contend with on the moon. I mean, temperatures can range from plus to minus 120 Celsius. You've got sharp rocks. Also, you're a problem, too. You're pumping out carbon dioxide and odors and getting all sweaty, and you're just gross. But the Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit is designed to handle all of this, and it's much more agile than its Apollo counterparts. Now, it wasn't easy picking up things bending at the knee in the Apollo suits, but with the new one, you can throw a little back into it. In addition, the atmospheric pressure inside the suit will be high enough to require no oxygen pre-breathing, and the carbon dioxide scrubbers can be reused. And a rear entry hatch will speed up donning and doffing, and the parts for the suits they're interchangeable. In addition, the Orion Crew Survival System suit made its debut as well, looking like a highly modified shuttle-era advanced crew escape suit. It'll be used for protecting the astronauts on launch day, in contingency situations, dangerous periods of the missions near the moon, and during atmospheric re-entry. Unlike fashion, having styles and seasons that come and go, the XEMU is designed to work in a multitude of places. So it's not just the moon, it's also designed to work in Mars, in a microgravity environment, inside of a spacecraft. So it is quite the upgrade over the current EMU spacesuits. And really, the only question I can think of now is to ask, you know, which runway should we have it walking down? And if you've got new suits, you got to take them somewhere, and you can't do that without a lander. So NASA has opened up for a round of solicitation, and you've got a week left to submit your ideas. Now, there's a few things that NASA is going to want your lander to do, so here are some of the requirements. You need to deliver a payload of 965 kilograms to the surface of the moon. You need to spend at least a week on the lunar surface. You need to allow for at least two spacewalks with a goal of five spacewalks using those new XEMUs. And you need to return 100 kilograms of lunar samples. We want some more moon rocks! And it better work. See, NASA, they are skipping the Apollo 9, Apollo 10 test flights of the lunar module in favor of just getting the Artemis lander to the surface with a crew on its first time in its in space. Now that's a bit gutsy, but uh, maybe a little bit of the wrong kind of guts. And this first lander design, it won't require reuse, but future designs for the Artemis program, they will require reuse. Now, this week is the 70th International Astronautical Congress, and quite a few companies are showing off their prospective designs that they have for landers. So, let's take a look at a few. Gross! Who in the hell is designing these things? They look like they were beaten with an ugly stick, but only after the engineers calibrated the stick to a precise set of parameters. Suddenly, this doesn't make that awful red, white, and blue combo on the XEMU seem so bad. Sure, the engineers call the shots, and it's often function over form when it comes to space flight and spacecraft design, but wouldn't it be nice to see something that sort of inspires people to yearn for the optimistic view of the future that we do here at Tomorrow?
In the United States, NASA is unfortunately not really an independent agency. Uh, you see, they're kind of beholden to whatever the executive and legislative branches tell them to do, uh, including designs of vehicles and things like that. And uh, can the executive and legislative branch design vehicles? Well, I'm not going to go into that. But one nice thing about spaceflight here in the United States is that both of our major political parties support it quite a lot. But Artemis is raising some eyebrows amongst some of our folks. A hearing with the United States House Appropriations Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, Science, and Related Agencies put NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine in the hot seat with questions in regards to budgets to meet the 2024 timeline being, well, not answered very clearly. Now, one thing that I do like about Bridenstine is that he has said that he is not going to cut any other parts of NASA's budget in order to fund Artemis. Essentially, he wants more budget to be added in order to fund Artemis. Now, that would be nice if we actually got more budget. You see, earlier this year, it was proposed to give NASA an extra $1.6 billion on top of its budget for fiscal year 2020. But our house, part of the legislative branch, did not pass the budget with that $1.6 billion. And Jim Bridenstine has been on the record saying that over the next five years, we're likely going to need 20 to 30 billion additional dollars on top of what NASA is already getting in order to make sure that Artemis lands on that 2024 target. While Congress debates, Canada and Japan have joined the Artemis program as international partners. The European Space Agency is going to attempt to receive approval from its member states before the end of 2019, and Russia, they're working to determine how it might support the program. Canada and Japan's contributions are related to the proposed gateway in orbit around the moon. Japan is looking to provide logistic services with its next generation HTV-X cargo freighter. And Canada, they'll be providing a robotic arm known as the Canada Arm 3. Now, the European Space Agency is looking to provide a module that will help refuel landers and provide telecommunications. Overall, strong international partnership is key to helping make spaceflight, especially like this to deep space, actually possible in this era where budgets for space agencies are a shade of what they were in the fever pitch of the space race. Now, NASA hasn't said anything yet about a commercial partner or two coming on board to help with this, but I'm not one to start rumors either, but I mean, be a mighty good rumor to see fulfilled. And now, to talk a little bit about weather in space, here's Dr. Tamitha Scove. Space weather this week is about to get very interesting. As we flip to our front side sun, you can see that massive coronal hole. That's about to rotate in through the Earth's strike zone and will do so over the next couple days. It's going to be sending us some fast solar wind, and that could bring some much-needed aurora clear down to mid-latitudes. Now, the last time we saw this coronal hole, it brought us up to storm levels. So you aurora photographers, definitely get your batteries charged because you're going to need it. There's got a really good chance for some decent aurora show. Now, also, we had a polar coronal filament that lifted off over the last day or so. I haven't seen one lift off from about this size in quite some time. And the fact that it's really close to the poles, all of that is an indication that solar cycle 25 is getting much closer. But of course, we're not there yet. As we switch to our far side monitor, this is stereo, and it's kind of looking at the sun from the side. You can see we still have a very spotless sun even on the far side. So you amateur radio operators and emergency responders, we're still going to be dealing with some poor uh, radio propagation easily over the next week. For more details on this week's space weather, including when and where to see Aurora and how amateur radio and GPS is going to fare, check out my channel or come see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. It's been quite interesting watching companies scrambling in order to try to lower the costs of access to space. They've been doing things like completely new designs, changing out their avionics, changing how things get out to the pad and are processed with other things like that. But Northrop Grumman, they've got something new and uh, it's pretty solid. The GEM-63 solid rocket motor has completed its final test firing, and it'll be replacing Aerojet Rocketdyne's AJ-60A solid rocket motors that United Launch Alliance has flown on Atlas V since 2003. Now, the GEM-63 is near identical in dimensions and capability when compared to the AJ-60A, but 
United Launch Alliance notes that it is significantly cheaper than flying the AJ-60A. So we'll have to see just how much cheaper flying those Gen 63s actually is. Now Northrop Grumman will be using its own version of the Gem 63 solid rocket motors on its launch vehicle Omega and the United Launch Alliance, they're going to use a new version as well of the Gem 63s on their Vulcan Centaur rocket. And I find that pretty interesting that even though they're both going to be competing against each other, they're using basically the same type of booster, I'll bet, with their own little customizations and what they want for their own launch vehicle. So the pressure to lower launch costs, it's it's really making companies rapidly come up with these new ideas and these cheaper alternatives. The Gem 63s that have just been tested, the ones that'll fly on Atlas V's, well, they're going to make their debut in late 2020 on NROL 101. This is going to be an Atlas V in the 551 configuration, so we're going to get the maximum five solid rocket motors on their debut. Thanks for watching this week's Space News, and you're definitely going to want to tune in this Saturday at 1800 UTC for tomorrow's Space's live interview show. We've got Kevin J. De Bruin. He is the fit rocket scientist. He's done work at JPL and a whole host of other companies. He was even on America Ninja Warrior, and I mean, maybe we'll have a push-up contest or something. Maybe we'll see who can eat the most hard-boiled eggs. I don't know. It's going to be pretty wild and, you know, tune in because we're going to talk science, we're going to nerd out over space, and who knows, you may end up getting some workout tips as well. And of course, we want to thank all the citizens of tomorrow. Without your help, we would not be able to do news. We wouldn't be able to do our live show. And we wouldn't be able to hit our goal, which is to get people excited about space. So if you got a little something out of the show and you'd like to give a little something back, you can head on over to youtube.com slash TMRO slash join. And you're definitely going to want to take a look at some of the ideas we have for our upcoming rewards. You might be able to listen in while we're doing our script work. You might even be able to listen into the control room. So head on over, take a look, and see what we got. And of course, you can hit that subscribe button, like our videos, hit the notification bell, so that way when we have our letting off steam shows, which we do not announce ahead of time, you can know when it's going on. And share the show with everybody you know, because hey, we want to get people excited about spaceflight. And how do we do that? Well, we get in front of people. And how can we do that? You can put us there. And if you can think of other ways to help out the show, you can also head on over to community.tmro.tv, post there, and let us know. As always, until the next Space News, keep exploring. <laughs> I sneezed. And I didn't cover my mouth either, because I'm gross. Sick. And then we go to voiceover. <laughs> It'll be replacing Aerojet Rocket Giants. Rocket Giants. I'm wearing my Rocket Giants. Testing, testing, testing. Sorry. Yeah, I'm going in the bloopers. Oh, God. Which runway are we going to walk on?